Luke 11 is where we'll be. We're continuing in this theme of prayer. Last week we saw the Lord's Prayer, or at least the shorter version of it, given in Luke's account. This theme of prayer will continue as we, uh, as we go on. Uh, we are in Luke 11. I wanted to start with this. Uh, uh, just a couple months ago, I went on a uh, missions trip to Denmark, to Copenhagen. It was particularly for this group of uh, Christian skateboarders. We went and were evangelizing in the plazas there, and I was part of the teaching ministry uh, during the prep times and things like that. So I went to Denmark, and I, I bought the cheapest ticket possible because uh, it was just me. <laughs> and I was kind of self-funding my own little mission trip. Red-eye flights, whatever. It's just me. I can handle it. <clears throat> the way out went through Philly. And on the way back, went through London, which is a place I've never been, but always been fascinated by. You know, you, you grow up with all the, the children's stories are set there. And, and there's lots of movies set there. So I was like, wow, I would love to see London. The only problem is that the flight on the way back, it went from Copenhagen to London, got in there about 10.30 at night, and then the following day at noon is when the flight came back to San Diego, 11-hour flight to San Diego. So yes, I'm that crazy. I was like, I'll, I'll take that flight because uh, I would like to see London, even if, for, if it's just for a few hours early in the morning, I'll wake up and I'll go, uh, go tour around the city. And uh, because I'm so frugal, read parentheses, you're cheap, right? Because I'm so frugal, I decided to just spend the night in the airport. I'm like, it's just a couple hours till daylight, right? Just a couple hours, and so I found a nice bench at a little cafe and take my shoes off and, uh, and just plop, <laughs> plop down on this bench. And so I did just that. It wasn't an extremely restful night, but it did the trick. And so I woke up and took the train to Paddington Station where that nice little bear got lost, I think. And so I, I got off at Paddington Station and I decided to walk through Hyde Park down into London and, and uh, I got to see Buckingham Palace, Big Ben, of course, Westminster Abbey. There's a lot kind of jam-packed in a small area in London. It's, a, it's kind of a dirty city too, I must say. The river, the Thames River is pretty filthy as well. It's just this brown... I mean, it makes Lindo Lake look kind of good. You know, that's, that's saying something. And so anyways, I, I'm, I'm going around, and all this time I'm looking at the, the clock. Oh, it's kind of easy, easy with Big Ben right there, you know? Looking at the clock, and okay, I have to make it to the airport three hours in advance for this international flight. So I was making good time. I got to see plenty, got back on the subway, headed straight to the airport, and I got out at the terminal, which I thought was the right terminal, but it wasn't. You see, Heathrow has five terminals. Uh, San Diego only has two. <laughs> and so their, their airport is so big, you actually have to get into transportation to go from one terminal to the next, underground transport. And so I got off of what I thought was the right terminal uh, because I took American Airlines, but it was operated through British, so I actually had to go and switch to the other terminal. All right, that takes about a half hour off. We're still good. Two and a half hours till flight time. And then I get to security. Extremely long line, just snaking back and forth, back and forth. Okay, this is taking a while, but we're still good. Get to the inspection uh, with uh, TSA, and I go to secondary. I mean, look at me, right? Guy looks sketchy. Let's check him out. So they, they bring me to secondary, they unpacked my entire bag, just laid it all out. It looked like a garage sale there. I just had everything laid out. And I, you know, I'm trying to, trying to be polite, but also firm. And you know, there's some different cultural differences between Americans and people from England. And you know, so I'm not, I'm not understanding their tone. I'm like, no, I, I kind of really need my stuff now because uh, you know, the flight's gonna close here pretty soon. So I gotta get down there. I'm like, all right, love, yeah, yeah. You know, it's Tuesday, what do they say? It's Tuesday, isn't it? It's not a big line today. Sorry, that was a horrible accent, by the way. So I was like, oh, whatever. And then uh, finally, when they're done looking at all my stuff, I have to put all the stuff back in. They didn't help with that. So I have, essentially have to repack my suitcase. And remember how I said I'm cheap? Of course, I just brought a carry-on. I didn't bring a real bag. I didn't want to check that. So I'm stuffing all the stuff, including souvenirs from my family, in this bag. And 
sitting on it, trying to get it to close. I get it closed, I run, I sprint to the gate, and I'm just drenched in sweat. I'm thinking, this is gonna be a miserable 11 hour flight, just totally wet with sweat. I get to the gate, and what do you think happened, folks? It was closed. The flight was closed. They wouldn't let me on. The, the plane was right there. I could see it. And I'm trying to ask the lady, you know, can I just, can I go on there? It's right, it's right there. And she said, no, that's not how it works. Once the door is closed, they can't reopen. So I was feeling extremely helpless at that moment. You know what? What can I do? You know, I'm thinking about my family. It was kind of, I was missing the family. It had been, it had been a nine, ten day trip. I'm just with a bunch of stinky skateboarders that whole time. And I'm thinking, I want to get back to my, my soft, lovely wife and my nice warm bed. And I'm thinking, man, this 11-hour flight, I don't, I don't know how many of these they would offer. And so I said, is there any, any possible way I can get to San Diego today? She said, well, there's actually two of these flights. I can get you on the one two hours from now. I said, perfect. <laughs> and so God got me through that. I got home on that flight. She did give me a little slap on the wrist, though. She said, next time, make sure you arrive early. I'm like, I tried. I tried. But I was, I was feeling helpless. I felt like there was nothing I could do about my predicament, no matter how hard I, I strived. And that brings us to today's passage. Up to this point in Luke, we've seen Jesus doing miracles. He's been teaching, preaching, casting out demons. Now he's on a determined march towards Jerusalem to die for our sins on the cross. But before he gets there... He continues to teach and instruct his followers along the way. And, and we've already seen in the first few verses of Luke 11, Jesus has been teaching his disciples about prayer. He modeled it for them as an example and then showed them how to pray. One of the disciples asked them, Lord, teach us to pray. And so he, he taught them this, the shorter version of what we call the Lord's Prayer. Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread and forgive us our sins for we ourselves also forgive everyone who is indebted to us and lead us not into temptation. And the disciples needed this reminder about the importance of prayer because they struggled with trying to handle things in their own strength. And so now Jesus is going to give them even more about this topic. He'll, he'll tell them a parable, the story of a man in a predicament, a man who can't fix the problem he's in. He is desperate and he's feeling helpless. And so Jesus uses this story to further teach his disciples about the importance of prayer. So let me pray, and then we'll read God's holy word together. Heavenly Father, we give this time completely to you, to use for your purpose in our lives. Lord, help us to learn to pray. And thank you that you are a good Father who wants us to pray to you. Father, you want a relationship with us, and so we can build that as we pray. So Father, we we continue to ask you to teach us, Lord, from your word, what it means to pray and who we're praying to. Father, we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, verse 5 of Luke 11 reads this way. It says, Then he, that is Jesus, said to them, Suppose one of you has a friend and goes to him at midnight and says to him, Friend, lend me three loaves. For a friend of mine has come to me from a journey and I have nothing to set before him. Okay, so Jesus is, is pausing to tell a parable. It's a, a small story with a big meaning, big application. And in order to appreciate what's taking place here, we have to learn something about the culture of first century Israel. You see, in the ancient Near East, hospitality was, was a huge deal, specifically to travelers and, and sojourners. Remember, these are, are times before uh, Best Western or, or La Quinta Inn, you know, that, that's not around, and so you have to stay with, with people. And for the Jew, company was seen as a blessing, as a gift from God. Hospitality is both commanded and commended in the Bible. The Israelites were, were told to be hospitable, to open their homes to those, especially those who were traveling. Now, this is kind of tricky for us because in America in 2024, sometimes we view company, particularly unannounced company, as a burden, not a blessing. A lot of people have those ring cameras on their, their door, right? And that's not for security purposes so much as kind of a caller ID for your house. It's like, no, I'm not going to go say hi to this person. You know, and there's that dreaded pop-in. You know, the no text, 
no warning. They just pull in, usually at the worst possible time when the place is a mess. And yes, I'm guilty of that as a pastor, right? I go and visit people. And uh, half the time, be honest, you don't want to see my face, right? But I'm there to bless you, okay? (laughs) And uh, in the Jewish culture, company was seen as a gift from God. However, there's a problem in this story. The host has no food. And by the host, this is the man who's going out to his friend's house to ask him for food. uh, Because he has none. And we're not told why. You know, maybe he had teenage boys. He ate all the sandwiches. and You know, he's got no bread left. But as a host, he's required to show hospitality. And yet, he doesn't have the resources. And he doesn't want to be guilty of violating Jewish customs. And so, as our story starts out, this man understands how needy he is. He makes a humble admission of it. He says, I have nothing. We see he's self-aware enough to realize that he is in need. And that brings us to our first lesson about prayer this morning. This parable will be about prayer, as you'll see. The first thing that we learn here is that prayer begins with honest self-awareness. Honest self-awareness. The man humbly admits, I have nothing. Now, the more we understand just how small, finite, and needy we are, the more we understand how vital it is to approach God in prayer. When we grow in our understanding of the depth of our need, how much we're lacking, we grow in our understanding of our need to pray. Sometimes we don't pray because we don't honestly self-assess and realize that we are needy. Uh, Because our our modern culture, society teaches us to be self-made, to be self-sufficient, to be self-sustained. And as a result of all that influence, one thing in reality many of us have become is, is not very self-aware. That is to say, not aware of who one really is. We live under this illusion that, that we're the ones in control. But that is not so. Uh, they say ignorance is bliss. But let's, uh, let's break that up for a second. Let's actually stop for a moment and reason together. My, my fellow mortals. All right? Just pause and consider all the things in this universe that you're not actually in control of. You're not in control of your very coming into existence. All right, it just kind of happened to you. You don't choose the parents that made you. You don't choose the, the family you're born in. You didn't choose the year you were born. That was all out of your control. Other things that are out of your control are the decisions of other people. Even your own children or, or your neighbors. You can't control what they do. You can't control whether the people that you love, if they will love Jesus or not. You can't control the economy. You can't control the weather. You can't control the future. You can't control the government. You can't control when you will die. You didn't have any control over the start of your life, and you won't have control over the end of it. It doesn't matter how much kale or gluten-free bread that you consume in this world. That kind of thing won't keep you from an accident, right? You could be stuffed with kale and get hit by a car and you're done. (laughs) One single call from the doctor can make all that illusion of control come crashing down on you. None of these things you can control. What can you control? The one thing you can control is whether you take the things you can't control to the one who has full and absolute control. And that's what prayer is. That's exactly what prayer is. So once an honest assessment is made, this man takes his need to someone who can help him. Uh, But before we go any further, just introspect. What about you? What about me? Are we self-aware enough to know just how desperate we actually are? Are you frustrated because you have needs in your marriage, needs in your health, needs in your finances, needs in your relationships or family? You can allow these needs to tempt you to doubt God, or you can see your needs as a blessing, as God's way of getting your attention, saying, hey, come to me, child. You have nothing, but I have everything. And so this is why we pray. Now back to the the parable. Notice something. What time did this man show up to his friend's house to make his desperate request? Midnight. Yikes. It's interesting, right, that this man appears so comfortable showing up 
at such an ungodly hour. And we learn that he's not some complete stranger, but that he's a, a friend of the other man. There's, there's some kind of existing relationship here. It's not like he's just going up to someone he never met. You know, hey, my name's Bob. Got any biscuits for me? You know, <laughs> I, got, I got company I need to provide for. No, there's a relationship there. And you know that this is true of us with God. We believers, now I'm, I'm only talking to believers in Christ right now. For those of you who have placed your faith in Jesus Christ, you are a Christian. You can boldly approach God in prayer at any time. Why? Because we have a relationship with him through Jesus Christ, his son. Hebrews chapter 4, starting at verse 14, it says, Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. Therefore, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. So drawing near to, to God's throne in confidence because of Christ. Our Heavenly Father who made us sent Jesus to rescue us from our sins and now through faith in Jesus we can become God's children and God is a wonderful Father who delights to see his kids coming to him. There's a relationship there. And prayer should always be about growing in our relationship with God our Father. Uh, it should never primarily be about getting stuff. It's not simply transactional, but rather it's relational. Uh, just a simple, silly illustration, but, you know, sometimes we're guilty of just going through a rapid-fire prayer list like we're ordering something at a drive through window. <laughs> you pull up, and you're like, yeah, uh, dear God, I'd like uh, two healed relatives. Uh, let's see here. Uh, I'd like a raise at work. Uh, I'd like a baby, but hold the crying and the diaper change stuff. And, uh, and I'd also like a big, fat, huge house. All right, thank you. Amen. I'll pull through. All right? <laughs> and it's true. Some, some conversations and interactions are supposed to be transactional and not relational, like that drive through window. All right, can I take your order? And imagine you're like, whoa, 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 buddy, don't rush this. All right? Let's get to know each other. How are you doing? How are you really doing today? You'd be like, all right, weirdo. <laughs> I don't have time for this. You know, it's not an appropriate place to hear about everything on your heart. It's a place to get your spicy chicken sandwich and move on. But prayer, on the other hand, it is an interaction that is primarily relational. And yet we treat it as primarily transactional. We just lob all the stuff we want at God. And we really shouldn't do that. Uh, but here's what's so amazing about God. God already knows what we want and need and the things that, that we need before we even knew that we needed them. Matthew 6, verse 8 says this, For your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. And He does invite us to pray and talk to Him about these things, even though that's not prayer's primary purpose. But we, we should not simply go to God to get stuff. We should go to God to get God. The most significant gift we can receive from Him, after all, is He Himself, His presence, and prayer is an opportunity to grow closer to Him, to abide to remain, to be with him. It's been said, prayer is the soil where intimacy with God grows. So now let's get back to the story in our text. The host takes his need to his other friend. He didn't have food, so he goes and asks him to have some to give. He makes his problem his friend's problem, in other words. <laughs> uh, but now there's another problem. Back to the cultural setting. Israel, typically a hot, arid place. In ancient times, most of the dwellings would have one big kind of multi-purpose room. And at night, they would, they would roll out a mat and have the whole family sleep in the same room. During the day, however, they would leave the door open. It would let the air in, let it kind of air out in there. And it was also a sign of an open door of hospitality. People could come in and live life with you. But at some point in the evening, you close the door. Uh, remember, what time is this at? Midnight. So the door is closed. Uh, this is like a nonverbal sign saying, okay, we're done peopling now. Move along. When the door is shut, the people inside are not to be bothered. 
Uh, but the friend still goes up to the house. He knocks and he asks for a few loaves of bread. Now watch how his friend, his quote, friend, responds. Look at verse 7. So, and from inside, he answers and says, Do not bother me. The door has already been shut and my children and I are in bed. I cannot get up and give you anything. This guy's like, you're going to wake up my family. Stop. (laughs) Got to get up and disrupt the whole house. Verse 8, I tell you, even though he will not get up and give him anything because he is his friend, yet because of his persistence, he will get up and give him as much as he needs. Now, don't you kind of sympathize with this guy sleeping? Don't sympathize that deeply right now by sleeping, okay? Uh, uh, This guy's probably a little grumpy. He's in his PJs already. You know, notice the guy calls him friend, and he doesn't call him friend back. He's a little aggravated, I think. He's like, guy, guy, go back to bed. Come back later. You're waking my family up. Haven't you heard of boundaries? And so we, we read that the door has been shut, that is locked. They would have had a bar on the inside that fastened the door securely against intruders. And, and he could have lifted the bar, right? He was physically capable of doing that. And so when he says, I can't, really what he means is, I won't. And this is the crazy part. This man is so desperate that he's willing to just unashamedly just keep on knocking, even after his friend tells him to beat it. And finally, his friend gives him what he needs, not because he is his friend, but because of this man's unblushing persistence. Uh, Actually, in the original language, the Greek word signifies shamelessness, because of this man's shamelessness. Just picture this guy. He's rapping on the door like a crazy man until he gets his need met, and he finally gets them met. And this leads to our second lesson today about prayer, that prayer matters because our God is a good provider. Prayer begins with self-awareness, honest self-awareness, and it matters because God is a good provider. Our God is a better provider than the grumpy sleeper in the story. And uh, as I was studying this text, I I got kind of worried because I I was thinking, man, I I don't want the people of the church to misunderstand what they're reading here because I think there's an interpretational trap you can fall in here. This story is told to be a, a contrast rather than a comparison. Or you could, you could put it this way. This is a good teaching from a bad example. So put your thinking cap on here. Understand what's happening here. This parable is not to show us what God is like, that, that God is some kind of crotchety, groggy friend, quote, who's annoyed by you, whose door is only open to you for certain hours, who the only way to get what you want from him is to nag him until he's sick of hearing you talk. That's horrible, right? That's not the point of the parable. No, Jesus is actually making the exact opposite point about God. Do you see it? This is a classic rabbinic teaching method called call the homer, which means how much more. Everybody say, how much more? How much more? We see this a lot, actually, in the New Testament. It's an argument from the minor to the major. In other words, if A is so, then B must surely be so. And the idea in, in this story is this. If the lazy, good-for-nothing neighbor will get up to avoid being shamed by his lack of hospitality, then how much more will our great God and Father answer the door of prayer when we knock? Because he's our Father, and we're his kids. Or to put it, in a, in a different way, if even a tired, annoyed, crotchety neighbor will eventually meet the need of his friend, even at midnight, how much more will your heavenly father, who never gets tired, meet your needs because he's the perfect dad? Contrast, not comparison. Our God is never annoyed by our requests. He's always willing to listen to us. In fact, God actually loves it when we bring our requests to him. Yes, even our dumb, selfish requests, he's willing to listen to those. Just, just read the lamentations of the prophets. Some of these, these men of God, these prophets even ask God, kill me, God. And God just listened to him saying, yeah, no, I'm not going to do that. 
but you can still talk to me. You can still pour out to me. And we should linger with the Lord in prayer because he just wants to spend time with us. In fact, it's his will for us. Listen to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 16 through 18. It says, Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, in everything give thanks, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. The will of God to pray without ceasing. And God won't give us everything we ask of him because he's good. And not everything we ask of him is a good thing. You know, just like a, a good parent, good mom, good dad, won't feed their children ice cream all the time just because they ask for it. Or you know what they need. And at the moment, we think we know what we need, but sometimes God has the bigger picture that we can't see, and he sees the end of today, he sees tomorrow, he sees next year, he sees 100 years from now. He's already there, in fact. So therefore, we should bring every single request to him, and he's big enough to sort it all out. As we've talked about before, sometimes his answer is yes, sometimes it's no, sometimes it's wait, but the answer is always what's best for us because God is a great heavenly father. Romans 8, 28 says this, we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. God's will is what we would ask for if we had all the facts, if we knew what God knows. And so we ought to trust the Father's heart, as we pray. And this is why Jesus ends his lesson the way he does. Look how he continues in verse 9. He says, So I say to you, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds. And to him who knocks, it will be opened. Now suppose one of you fathers is asked by his son for a fish, he will not give him a snake instead of a fish, will he? Or if he has asked for an egg, he will not give him a scorpion, will he? And so these, these illustrations are so vivid, aren't they? It goes from the illustration of a friend asking from another friend, and now it's, it's even more intimate. It's a child asking of his father. There's even more of a relationship there, and so there should be less reluctance to ask. Just think about this. What dad do you know would give his kids a plate full of scorpions when they ask for an omelet. Right? Or they ask for bread and you toss them a rock, say, hey, chew on that, kid. That's cruel. That's messed up. Why would you give them something harmful when they're expecting something good? Not even, not even evil people do that. And so Jesus says, come to, come to God. He's, he's a great father. And he loves to hear his kid's voice. And he wants to hear what's on your heart. And actually, there's something really cool here in the original, too. The commands there in verse 9 are the present active imperative, which often carry this significance of continuation, like keep on asking, keep on seeking, or keep on knocking. This is an invitation to a lifestyle of continuous prayer. And then Jesus finishes like this, verse 13. If you then, being evil, notice he he doesn't sugarcoat it, does he? you human beings. You're sinners. He says, if you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more, once again, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? We are evil. We are sinners by nature and by choice. We all fall short of God's glory. We all miss the mark. We're imperfect. We sin. And so we need God's grace and mercy. That is what we need most. And notice what Jesus says to us. What, what can we receive from the Heavenly Father if we ask him? We can receive his Holy Spirit. Did you know that there's some prayers that the Father always says yes to? And this is one of them. What Jesus says here should, should really fire us up. God will give us the Holy Spirit if we ask him. He might not give you the numbers to Powerball, if you ask him. He might not give you a nice car with these spinny rims or whatever you want. <laughs> but he'll give you something much better than that. He'll give you his Holy Spirit to indwell you. We read in the Bible that Jesus Christ, he, he lived and he died and he rose and he ascended. And then he sent his church the gift of the Holy Spirit, who comes to live and dwell within believers. And the Holy Spirit's amazing, just 
Just listen to a few of the things the scripture says about this third member of the Trinity. He convicts us of sin. He regenerates us. He confirms to us that we belong to the Lord. He installs us as members of Christ's church. He sanctifies us. That is, he, he makes us holy. Helps us to become more like Jesus. He gives us spiritual gifts, which are God-given abilities for service. He leads us into all truth. He helps us understand and apply the scripture to our daily life. As you're hearing God's word, even this morning, it's the Holy Spirit in you that is helping you to realize the ways in your life that you need to live this out. That's the Holy Spirit at work. And more than that, he teaches us how to pray, and he intercedes for us when we don't know how to pray. He enables us, and he strengthens us, and he empowers us to live for Christ. He comforts us, and in Ephesians it says he seals us unto the day of redemption. And so if you ask the Father to give you the gift of his Holy Spirit... He's always going to say yes to that prayer because he is a good father. This is a radical teaching, right? We, we live in a materialistic culture. And the powerful point that Jesus makes here is that our greatest need is spiritual and not physical. It's not what's in our bank account, in our house, in our driveway. It's who is in our heart, the Holy Spirit. That's, that's what matters. That's what we should be asking for. And that is who Jesus wants us To receive, And so we reach one final lesson today. Sometimes I don't receive what I pray for because it's not what Jesus wants me to receive. Evaluate the things that you pray for. Are they more physical in nature or are they more spiritual in nature? Are you praying for more of the Holy Spirit's work in your life? Or are you praying more about things that you want? You know, for some people, they struggle with prayerlessness... Because of their pride. Other people, they pray, but they only pray about selfish things. Let's say you could fall into a ditch on both sides. James 4, 3 says this, You ask and do not receive, because you ask with wrong motives, so that you may spend it on your pleasures. See, this promise that Jesus makes in verse 9 about, Ask and it will be given, seek and you'll find, knock and it will be open to you. It's with the assumption that you're asking for things that are in God's will. But lots of us, our prayers sound like this. Dear God, give me a raise so I can make more money. Dear God, fix my annoying spouse. Dear God, would you send my boss to another state? You know, things like that. It's me focused. But are there there other more eternal things that we can pray for? Are you praying for your love for Jesus to grow? I would find it hard for God to say no to that. Or are you praying to become more intimate with the Lord? Are you praying for the Holy Spirit to convict of sin in your heart? Like like King David say, examine me, God. See if there's any unrighteous way in me. Are you praying for the Holy Spirit to help you obey God's word in those hard places? Are you praying to grow in your appreciation and application of God's word? Why would God, our good Father, ever say no to any of those kind of prayers? Our Heavenly Father loves to say yes to prayers like those. And his door is never shut to his children. So what need do you have in your life today that you have not yet brought to the Lord? That you haven't started knocking on his door about yet? God is a good father who always has time for his kids. Would we have the heart of a trusting child and be confident in our prayers? Not because we got the words just right, but instead because of the goodness of God to whom we pray. He's not a grumpy neighbor. He's a good father. Remember that. That's the point of the parable. That being said, he's only a father to his children. We've been seeing this the last couple times in our studies. Are you God's child? He's only a father to his children. John 1 says this, starting in verse 9, There was the true light which, coming into the world, enlightens every man. This is speaking of Christ. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. He came to his own, and those who were his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, 
even to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Today, if you want to call God your father, you can. But first, you must be born again. You must repent of your sin and turn and trust to Jesus Christ, God's son who, who gave his life for us. He was killed on the cross for us in our place. He was buried and he rose again on the third day, conquering sin and death. And all who trust in him, call him Lord and Savior, will be saved and then can enter the family of God and call God their father. So before anything, have you asked the Lord for his salvation? Have you asked the Lord to receive his Holy Spirit? I want to end with one more scripture. This is from Titus chapter 3, starting verse 5. It says, He saved us, not on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness, but according to his mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out upon us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that being justified by his grace, we would be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. So today, repent, believe, and receive the Lord. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can approach you as an amazing dad. You always want what's best for us. And you're always willing to hear our our prayers. Father, would you make our prayers more in tune with your will? that we would know how to pray, what to pray for, and pray for the things that are most important for all eternity. Thank you for this promise that for those who ask for your Holy Spirit, you will give it to them. Father, maybe that's someone here today who has not yet started a relationship with you. Up till now, they they couldn't have called you their father. But today they want to enter the family, and they can do that by turning in trust to the Lord Jesus Christ, acknowledging him as their Lord and Savior. So maybe they want to verbalize that now and pray this in their heart. Say, dear God, forgive me for my sins. I know that I have missed the mark. I know that I've fallen short, but I trust that you are good. And I believe that you have mercy and grace for a sinner like me. And and you showed that when you sent Jesus Christ to die on the cross for my sins and raised from the dead on the third day. So I have that eternal hope, and I'm privileged to call you my father now. Lord, receive me into your family as your child. Father, help us to uh, come to you boldly in prayer, because that's your will. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen.